Hey ho, Tudor minded people. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tudor Time Machine, and this is episode 18 of our podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're new here, it's best to start at episode one. This is a story project and it goes in order. We've had such a great time researching it and working on it and especially bringing it to you. At this point in our story, Constance and Philomena have discovered that Sir Thomas Wyatt's dear sister is Lady Margaret Wyatt. Now we're going back in time to 1526 and the court of Henry VIII. After the reading, we'll have some fun discussing the history beyond our tale and making connections between then and now. Read on, Jesse. Chapter 18, 1526, Petworth House, in which Anne Boleyn inspires words of caution and adoration. Anne was a mischievous puck, Margaret fumed as she searched room after room. This house was a maze. Of all the places she had stayed in during the King's summer progress, this was the most confusing. The royals dragged a dizzying number of courtiers on these country jaunts, and yet Anne would be missed. Queen Catherine was the sort of mistress who noted even one of her retinue absent. The Queen barely tolerated Anne. But did Anne care? Did Anne behave prudently? She did not. So it was up to Margaret to find her and drag her down to the Lammas Eve celebration. Margaret pushed open another door. Books. A room entirely of books. And knowing Anne, she was here. Somewhere. Lagging lady! Oh, lagging lady! Margaret whispered and rounded the room, peeking behind a vine-carved chair and a sea-weathered chest. There was Anne, curled in a corner with a book on her lap. Engrossed, are you? Mm-hmm. Will you share what pithy words you read that make you neglect your duties? If you like. I am a glutton for the thing called love, a bigger glutton than the ones who sit all day as the full hours flit and hold they're happier than the gods above. They swill down wine, while I, my turtle dove, choose milk, and I find I am content with it. Turn on the spigot, let us draw a bit. Yes, I am a very glutton, dear, for love. And what, in truth, is more divine than lust? To lust and love we will raise a litany, and do a little genuflection, too, since when all is said, we do but what we must, like any abbess in her priory. For an abbess, dear, is just like me and you. Anne laughed as she finished. It cannot possibly say that, Margaret protested. It does. You read Italian. I translated word for word. Artino is a roguish truth-teller. He exaggerates. Tis not so, dear Margaret. Do we not wish to see a lust-starved abbess sated? By my troth, Queen Catherine should read this. She is in a fog, imagining everyone in religious habit a saint. Margaret clucked in frustration. Are you preparing to level a scolding at me, Maggie Magpie? You are not inclined to listen to my good sense, so I will not give it breath. Read it for yourself, Anne said, holding out the book to Margaret. Your understanding is far greater than mine. Such flattery only works on men. We must go, Anne. It is the Lammas Feast. The Queen is always dissatisfied with me. I may as well please myself by reading. You will be missed and earn yourself a flogging. You are too extreme. Avant, come with me. They begin the apple bobbing. I will stay here. Margaret thought of something to entice Anne. My brother has returned. He will be there. Will he? And is he as handsome as when I last saw him? Hmm, Margaret teased. He has been a long time in France. He has eaten rather too well, drunk too much wine, his belly hangs, and those red gold locks are lost, and his teeth are brown and glazed. Liar! I am sure he is far handsomer than any man in the king's service. He may be, or not. You must see with your own eyes. Sounds, you task me cruelly, Anne stood. Are you coming, Margaret? I am. My apologies for holding you up. Margaret curtsied. Madge Shelton did look very tempting with a bright red apple between her teeth, Thomas Wyatt had to admit. She had gone after the floating fruit like a master fisherman and was jumping up and down and shouting, I win! I win! as Queen Catherine's other ladies dried their faces and fixed their damp hair. He imagined himself the napkin that Mary Zouche was using to wipe her bosom. 
I like a jumping lass, Cromwell said, grinning. He had the face of a brute, but Wyatt liked it, and he admired Cromwell. He had risen high at court in the time Wyatt had been away. All the talk was how Cromwell made money breed. Two shillings became a fine sovereign just by being in his purse. Wyatt himself cared nothing for money but to spend it. With his skill, Cromwell might make him a loan. He certainly needed one. "'Cromwell, where is your master, the Cardinal Wolsey?' Wyatt inquired. "'I bless myself to be out of the Cardinal's sight. "'That is why you take your ease.' "'Wyatt!' called Sir Thomas More. "'I have not seen you since your return. "'You did fine service in France. "'My congratulations.' "'Thomas!' all three of the men turned, then laughed. "'Wyatt took a bit of pride in his handsome sister as she approached. "'Mistress Margaret!' called Cromwell. "'Come, stand with us. "'You will double our enjoyment.' They were good friends, thought Wyatt. Had fate spun differently, they could have been more. But Cromwell was already married. Margaret, too, was good with money, and her wit would keep a man well interested. Who was there behind her? Anne? Anne? Coming towards him from the other side of the park? The massive bonfire sparked behind her. She floated on the billowing smoke, a Venus rising not from water but from fire. Then Anne was simply beside him, looking at him in that way her eye like Delilah's knife shearing his hair. He knew Anne's crooked nose, her little tiny neck, her head a hard gem. Yet in the time he had been away, it was as if her faulty features had congealed. Her unexpected beauty made him want to insult her. Sir Thomas, Anne curtsied. And Sir Thomas, and Sir Thomas, well met. All the men bowed. Wyatt spoke. Mistress Anne, good evening. You come not to greet me, I am sure, but to ask of your favoured court. Sir, are you rested from your travels? she asked. The music filled the evening and the dancing commenced. Margaret said, Thomas, my brother, do you not hear? Bring Anne to dance. Thomas two and three, join me. They were off, and Wyatt prepared to duel with this nimble-minded Boleyn. Now you have inquired of me, Mistress Anne, do you prepare to ask after your French friends? Well, why should I not ask how they are? Have you not helped King Francis and spent much time with his sister in negotiating his release from Spain? I believe she is the point. Indeed, is she well? Who? My lady. Your lady is across the green, dancing with her husband the king. The moon shows her in good health. Sir, why do you clog my desire to know of the Lady Marguerite? She was my mistress. I miss her sorely. Did he aggravate her because he had not noticed her bird grace until this moment? or was it that he wanted her to notice him? He used his long limbs to good effect and leaned against a statue of Poseidon, throwing his arm up behind his head and flexing his muscles as he did so. Sir, has some sprite stolen your sense? I will inquire elsewhere of Marguerite. Writing himself, he said, Mistress, the Lady Marguerite holds you in high esteem. She spoke of your learning and how your voice is missed among her ladies. All your friends are well. I am gratified to hear it. How I envy your travels. You must have relished Francis's court. Wyatt lied outrageously. After hearing so much of its finery, I found it dull. Dull? Dull? Is this possible? Were you struck blind and deaf on your arrival? No. Yet it must have been so. You, Sir Thomas, I know you, an admirer of letters, music. If you had been awake, France would have been a paradise. Bode or the poet Marot, could none of them hold your attention? They are not your babes, Mistress Anne, must you be so flustered? It is a great court, you wish to make it a nothing. My Lady Marguerite herself would write plays for us to perform. How gorgeously she chose her words and pictures. I loved speaking the speech. Of what can a lady write? Women do not have the long passions of men. Yet many men have passion measured only in seconds. Anne said, smiling with that private air, as if she had a secret that he must wheedle out of her. You tease me because you cannot know the all-consuming fire of the mind and the Herculean task of transforming it into the lyric art of Apollo. Sir, you frighten me. How strenuous you find the poet's art. He saw he was gaining her notice, finally. For you, mistress, I would undertake such a labour. You surprise me. Of what will you write? When we were babes in Kent, the lilt in her voice contracted his heart. No, the lies of reminiscence are tedious. Yes, and we have both emerged from our chrysalides. This flattery encouraged him. 
I will write of this very moment, of you, mistress. Will you accept my verse? If you will accept my opinion of it, sir. Wyatt determined to write such a verse that she should fall in love with him. Though she filled his mind, his poetic phrases were only partial and broken. He would conjure an image, then despise it. Failure would mean losing her interest forever. Wyatt avoided Anne, dodging her in the hallways, at table, in the garden, at the hunt. It was as if she had split into fifty Annes, turning up wherever he went. Words for other women had flowed in waterfalls, spilling out in a mad rush of generalities. But this poem must be a clear stream, running only for her. At last, Wyatt sent Anne his verse. The lively sparks that issue from those eyes, against the which there availeth no defence, have pierced my heart and done it none offence. With quaking pleasure more than once or twice, was never man could anything devise, sunbeams to turn with so great vehemence to daze man's sight, as by their bright presence dazed am I, much like unto the guise of one stricken with dint of lightning, blind with the stroke, and sighing here and there. So call I for help, I know not when nor where, the pain of my fall patiently bearing, for straight after the blaze, as is no wonder, of deadly noise, I hear the fearful thunder. In this chapter, we're not at Whitehall or Greenwich with Henry VIII, but we are with the movable court on progress. And we really start to get to know the Wyatt siblings in this chapter. And they both really were at Henry's court. Their father, Sir Henry Wyatt, served Henry the Seventh, and he stayed on to serve Henry the Eighth when Henry took the throne in 1509. So Sir Henry Wyatt didn't die until 1537, so he and his son Thomas both served Henry the Eighth at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> All these Henrys. I know. It's absolutely crazy making. But Margaret Wyatt was born in about 1503 and was at court in the 1520s. And she and her brother Thomas grew up at Allington Castle in Kent. Anne's family home, Hever Castle, is also in Kent. And we've read how Margaret, Thomas, and Anne were neighbors and would have known each other well as children. I'm not sure that makes sense. The distance between the two castles is 26 miles. In the 16th century, that would have been a good four or five hour ride. They might have gone between castles for big events and the families would really certainly have known each other because of connections at court. But I don't think there'd be a sort of, oh, let's hop over to the Boleyns for a quick swim in the moat. <laughs> or a picnic or a joust. <laughs> but whether they were close childhood friends or just acquaintances, Anne Boleyn, Margaret, and Thomas did know each other before meeting at court. Sir Thomas Wyatt joined Henry VIII's household in 1515. So Sir Thomas was about 10 years younger than Henry, but they were said to really resemble each other. They were both over six feet tall, which was giant for those days, both reportedly very handsome and had reddish hair. And Wyatt was a talented musician, an athlete, and of course, a great poet. Wyatt was a dashing Renaissance yes. fellow, yes. And he married Elizabeth Brooke. We want to stick with just the very small palette of names. <laughs> um, in 15th, Another Elizabeth. <laughs> yes. But the marriage was very unhappy, and Wyatt separated from her on the grounds that she was unfaithful. But it, who knows what really happened? We don't have Elizabeth Brooke's side of the story. Recorded history is, he said, he said. 100%. Yes. Sir Thomas had a pretty convenient out with his wife. Henry VIII made him an ambassador in 1524, and he spent much of the next years abroad. In this chapter, we see Wyatt on his return. He's caught up with Henry's court that's on summer progress. We chose Lammas Day for this scene because we thought the traditions of Lammas Day, which was celebrated on August 1st, were fun. It was a harvest festival, which predated Christianity, like so many church feast days. I think it must have been a little like a Halloween party with apple bobbing, dancing, and bonfires. Thomas Wyatt has been away for a while, so we see him reuniting with his court friends. Cromwell was a genuinely old friend of the Wyatt family, a patron of Thomas Wyatt's, and by all accounts, someone who was willing to lend him a lot of money. There are letters that survive between Thomas Cromwell and Margaret Wyatt where they discuss Thomas Wyatt's debts 
And Margaret bemoans the fact that her brother is such a big spender. Historically, Margaret was more thrifty than Thomas. Absolutely. And Cromwell was there to lend Thomas some money when he needed it. Cromwell got Wyatt out of some sticky situations and promoted his interests with Henry VIII. Wyatt must have really relied on Cromwell. And the poem he wrote on the execution of Cromwell in 1540 shows that. He said, My pillar of support has perished, the strongest influence on my troubled mind. I cannot find another to replace that pillar. From east to west, you would not find someone to ease my misfortune. By chance of fortune has torn away my inner and outer joy. I, alas, have no choice but to mourn daily until death relieves me. What more can I have but a woeful heart? The pen I use and my voice cry. My mind woeful and my body in pain. And I must hate myself until death relieves me of my misery. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that is intense. He, Thomas writes that he has to hate himself until he dies. As if he feels he failed Cromwell somehow. But I'm not sure anyone could have interceded with Henry to save Cromwell. I think at this point when he wrote this poem, Thomas Wyatt must have been just exhausted by all the executions. And as we discussed in episode 15, Wyatt also wrote very emotionally about the executions of Anne Boleyn and the five men who died with her. It's overwhelming the way Henry VIII executed all of his friends, and yet court is the only game in town, so he stays. But I also want to say, I think the idea that the men of this time didn't express their emotions to each other is just false. I mean, you read this poem that Thomas Wyatt wrote about Thomas Cromwell, and it's so deeply emotional and so personal. And, you know, they must have had a really close friendship. I, I think they but, did. Mm. You know, it, it was also a bloody time, and that must have really just been overwhelming emotionally for, for the people who had to witness it. In this chapter of Time's Riddle, Wyatt also sees Anne again for the first time in a while, and he is bowled over <laughs> by her. But she wants to talk about her friends at the French court. Cromwell was Wyatt's patron and had known Wyatt from the time he was a young man and helped him progress and gain Henry's favor. But it's interesting to remember that Anne's first patrons were not in England, but in Europe. And thinking about it, I sometimes wonder if those early years away from England actually had a part in Anne's downfall. Anne spent almost 10 years on the continent, and those were formative years, not just for her personally, but for establishing patronage from influential people. Her time in Europe made her glamorous when she came back to England, but it also made her a little suspect, you know, a little foreign. The powerful women who she served at the Burgundian and French courts, they weren't there to advise her in England. And she made a lot of enemies when she came back. And when she fell, you know, she fell very hard and very fast. It's true. Margaret of Austria, Louise of Savoy, and Marguerite of Navarre, these three women were huge influences on Anne. But they were also outspoken on politics, involved in diplomacy, and very vocal about religious reforms. All things that Anne was ultimately criticized for. They were her role models starting from a very young age, and they were all outspoken, yes, but they were also masters of diplomacy. You know, I sometimes just wonder if Anne had an incredibly powerful patron at Henry's court who could have advised her. You know, maybe she would have been more politic about some of the ways she treated people. And as you said, her French ways made her attractive, but also mistrusted. After so many years away, and also the way the English generally felt about the, the French. French, her European education began in 1513, when Sir Thomas Boleyn, Papa, got Anne... <laughs> Another <laughs> Thomas. <laughs> Another oh, Thomas. But this one is Anne's Papa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, he got Anne a place in the household of Margaret of Austria, which was a huge honor. There's so much debate about Anne's exact age when she left England, Eric Ives says she was born in 1501, which would have meant she was 12 at the time. But other historians say 1507, which would make her only six. And that seems really young to I me. I agree. 12 would have been young to go to another court as a maid of honor, but six 
That seems like actually a liability for the mistress. Kindergartner maid of honor. That doesn't sound at all helpful. <laughs> you and I both had six-year-olds, and we can say with confidence that a six-year-old, <laughs> mature or not, is not helpful. Cute? Yes. Helpful? No. And Margaret of Austria only had 18 ladies in waiting, so it seems odd that she would take a really young girl as one of the select few. And we know from researching the ladies that Elizabeth chose, girls who were 12 were often told they had to wait until they were older, so even 12 was pretty young. I just don't see any way Margaret would have taken on Anne if she were only six years old. Maybe she was a sort of Mozart of maid of honors. <laughs> At six. <laughs> I think we'll come down on the side of Eric Ives and accept 1501 as Anne's birth year. Okay, done. 1501 it is. So 12-year-old Anne goes to be educated at the Palace of Michelin in what is now Belgium. Margaret of Austria was a member of the super important Habsburg family, and her court at the time was the center of intellectual and political life in Europe. Which England was not. No. <laughs> Remember, Henry VIII had just taken the throne in 1509, he had aspirations to make his court splendid, but England is still a little behind other countries in terms of art, music, and literature. I've read some historians who consider the real Renaissance in England wasn't until Elizabeth's era. That makes sense. So in 1513, the European courts were much more sophisticated, and Margaret of Austria took on Anne Boleyn to have her educated at her court. Margaret was educating the children of her ill-fated brother, Philip the Fair, and her sister-in-law, Catherine of Aragon's sister, known as Juana la Loca, which is oh, not very kind. No. Oh, poor Juana. These children whom Anne was educated with would go on to be Charles V, King of Spain and Holy Roman Emperor, Eleanor, Queen of Portugal, Isabella, Queen of Denmark, Norway and Sweden, and Mary, Queen of Hungary and Bohemia. That is a pretty impressive group to be included in. Imagine what her school picture would have looked like. <laughs> By all accounts, Anne fit right in. Margaret wrote to Thomas Boleyn commending Anne and thanking him for sending her. So Anne made an impression, even as a tween, and even amongst this incredibly royal group of children. The next move for Anne came in 1514, when it was arranged for her to be one of the ladies-in-waiting for Mary Tudor, who was about to marry the King of France, Louis XII. Anne left the court of Margaret of Austria and traveled to Paris. I mean, again, Anne must have made an impression, and her French must have been superb, because Louis XII dismissed many of Mary Tudor's ladies after the wedding, saying he wanted his new wife to be surrounded by French women. But Anne made the cut, and she was allowed to stay. But Louis died three months after the marriage, and Mary Tudor hightailed it back to England to marry her first love, Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk. And Anne stayed in France. So we don't know if Mary asked her to return to England with her, but it would have been natural for Anne to go back at that point. Again, she must have made an impact on these French people. The new king, a young man of 19, Francis the A young person. A young person. <laughs> a young person of 19. <laughs> Francis the first placed her in the household of his 15-year-old wife, a very young person, <laughs> Queen Claude. And this is where Anne met two amazing women who made a huge impression on her, Louise of Savoy and Marguerite of Navarre. Louise of Savoy was Francis's mother. Her husband had a distant claim to the throne of France, which, of course, he passed on to his son. But her husband died early in their marriage when Louise was only 19 years old. Her husband must have thought extremely highly of her because he gave her sole custody of their children and the right to all his property. And that's significant because it wasn't the norm. As we said in an early episode, many of the wards in England, their mothers might still be alive. Right. When their fathers died, they were placed in ward wardship. And this certainly the widow didn't inherit all the property. I mean, that was quite quite extraordinary. So she must have been another very impressive young person. Only 19, Louise was still able to maneuver on her son's behalf, moving her family to Paris to be closer to court. Yes, her son Francis did have a distant claim to the throne, but Louise really promoted him in the French succession, and she was able to arrange for him to marry the king's daughter, Claude. That's not why Francis succeeded Louis, though. He succeeded him because Louis named him heir of France. In France, the succession could not go to a woman. 
but marrying Claude cemented Francis as king. 19 and 15, the king and queen, this was very much a young person's court. Francis really trusted his mother, Louise of Savoy, and in 1515, the first year Anne was at the court, Louise ruled as regent because Francis was away fighting the Italians. So Anne sees this very powerful woman in control, and I think that must have made an impression on her. We, we don't know how involved the 14-year-old Anne was with Louise, but she was there at court for seven years, and she was away from England from 12 to 19, and those are extremely formative years. Louise was a role model for Anne, but her daughter, Marguerite of Nevers, was even more so. Marguerite was Francis's elder sister, and the siblings were very close. Frances had tremendous amount of respect for her, and later on, when she was in hot water with the Catholic establishment for some of her religious views, he protected her. Queen Claude was often sick, and she was born with a scoliosis that caused a hunchback, and she also had a club foot. Because of this, people thought that she would not be able to have children. But she did. <laughs> she had seven. Good for Claude. <laughs> yes. A tough lady in her own right. At the time, Anne was at the French court, and Claude was often ill or, of course, in confinement. And Marguerite basically commanded the court in her place. She was a diplomat, a religious reformer, a patron of the arts, an author, a linguist, and she has been called by historians the first modern woman. Right, she was a really remarkable person. Imagine the impression she must have made on teenage Anne. Marguerite was corresponding with Erasmus, Rabelais. She was open to religious reforms. Actually, in later years, she was a mediator between the Roman Catholics and the Protestants, in, including Calvin. She was very daring, and she and Francis were hosting Leonardo da Vinci when, while Anne was there. I mean, there was nobody of that stature in England at that time. just There just wasn't. And there's no reason to think Anne didn't thrive in this environment because she brought many of those influences back to England with her. But all good things must come to an end. Anne returns to life in England in 1521, and her father had thought to orchestrate her marriage to James Butler in order to settle the dispute over who would inherit the earldom of Ormond, but it just didn't work out. Can you imagine how it was for Anne to come back to the English court? She probably hadn't spoken English for 10 years, and she had been free to read and speak her mind about religion, and Henry's court must have seemed very behind the times to her. This was way before Henry even considered breaking with Rome. So these religious reforms really hadn't arrived in England yet. For Henry, Anne must have been incredibly exciting, she knew all these new ways of thinking, and Anne nurtured all of these friendships and alliances with these women, but they were in no position to help her once she got into trouble with Henry and made enemies at the English court. You know, Henry was very conservative despite his break with Rome, and he seems to have had a conflicted relationship with Anne's strength of character as a woman. He liked it in her as a mistress, but not in her as a wife. And that seems pretty typical to me. <laughs> in 1535, Anne sent a message to Marguerite saying that her greatest wish next to having a son was to see you again. Mm. So this amazing woman was very much on Anne's mind. But here we are in our story before Anne's involvement with Henry. So she's making an impression at court and Thomas Wyatt is completely struck by her. In his biography of Anne, which was the first of its kind, Thomas Wyatt's grandson, Sir George Wyatt, wrote of the impression Anne made on his grandfather, and George Wyatt suggests that this sonnet that we've included in the chapter, The Lively Sparks That Issue From Thine Eyes, was actually written about Anne. We'll have to see what kind of impression Wyatt's words make on Anne in following episodes. Yes. <laughs> Does she think that it's a good poem? Is it worthy or not worthy? But in the next chapter of Time's Riddle, we'll be taking our Tudor time machine back to 1565, or forward to 1565, <laughs> depending on how you think about it, to see Constance learn some surprising truths about her mistress, the Princess Cecilia. So leave us a comment on our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page. And if you have any questions about anything we've talked about today, send them our way on Facebook. We'd love to hear from you and we'll discuss them on air. 
And please consider supporting us on Podbean. Go to the support page and you'll see some of the fun perks we have. And we really, really appreciate your support. Remember to listen in next time for more Times Riddle and more tutor-minded talk. Thank you.